Yeah. All right. So welcome. This is the final session of the day in the green room. This is, you've already probably er heard most of this, but this is a 15th annual water conservation showcase. Uh, thank you to the co-organizers, the U.S. Green Building Council, East Bay Municipal Utility District, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, the American Institute of Architects Committee on the Environment, and the PG&E Pacific Energy Center. Uh, as you know, our presentation, the presentations are going to be available on the website after, so you don't need to take pictures of every single slide, although you can if you want. And there's, they're also going to be recorded. If you are trying to get continuing education credits, check the check the slides, which I will try to pull up. Mm. Uh -oh. Ah! Yay. Okay, so you'll need the codes that are going to be on the first two slides, and I'll get to that in a second. And if you stay till 5.30, there will be door prizes. So if you've been here this long, you might as well stay till 5.30. Restrooms, you should know where they are, but they're down the hall on the left. And if you need to exit for a fire, you go behind me and not towards the street. If there's an earthquake, please stay inside the building to avoid falling glass. If we do exit for an emergency, we're meeting at the carousels that way. And I think that's it for my housekeeping and my presentation of our, just the spiel, but I'd like to introduce these lovely panelists here, <laughs> whose names I will get to in a short moment. <laughs> We've got Tom Chestnut, CEO of ANN and Technology, Technical Services, in, which is based in Encinitas, California. He was a co-principal investigator on the just-completed AWE study titled Building Better Water Rates for an Uncertain World. And then we have Lisa Qualler, who is the program manager at the California Water Efficiency Partnership, where she oversees projects and research focused on the watershed approach to sustainable landscaping. And then Krista Reger. <laughs> I was supposed to check that before. <laughs> um, uh, she works as a water resources specialist at the Long Beach Water Department where she manages one of the longest running and most successful turf removal programs in the country. And thank you. Thank you, Jessica. So your GBCI course number is 0920 Does anybody need another minute or two with that? It'll uh, uh, be on the website. Um, so I wanted to uh, give you a brief overview of an Alliance for Water Efficiency Landscape Transformation Research Program on Improving Outdoor Water Use Efficiency Programs. Um, this is uh, phase two of an Alliance for Water Efficiency Outdoor Water Settings Research Initiative. Um, phase one uh, developed a summary of some prior research and developed questions for phase two. The six questions were what motivates people to change their landscape and irrigation practices to reduce the overall water requirement and use? What are the reasons and rationale for their landscape choices? And what barriers exist to landscape transformation and utility sponsored programs? These uh, first three are kind of process evaluation questions. Um, then there are also a set of questions on water savings. What's the range of water savings? the gallons reduced annually per impacted customer and per square foot of landscape that can be expected from reducing landscape water requirements. What factors influence the volume of water savings achieved from reducing irrigation requirements and how can water savings be maximized? So those were our six questions. 
Um, our work has uh, built on uh, work that was uh, undertaken previously on sustainable landscaping that developed a market transformation framework. Uh, you can ask Lisa more about that before. Um, but it really wants to look at market transformation when new products or practices emerge, are found to be superior, and make the prior prax practices obsolete. So uh, sustainable landscaping requires uh, more than one uh, approach uh, to transform customer uh, choice for landscaping. Um, to give you an idea of the research approach in this, um, the process evaluation involved uh, program documentation, interviews and progress reports, understanding how programs were implemented, what their original program design was, what they learned along the line, and how they adapted and changed. Um, the impact evaluation uh, sought to look at water use uh, from all over the country to use a consistent methodology and estimate water savings and address some of the questions of transformation, how it could be done better. Let's see, so uh, this is a typical kind of uh, market transformation curve uh, in that you've got uh, innovators, the early adopters, uh, then it kind of builds. You can also, instead of looking at this as a bell curve to complete saturation, uh, you can look at it, uh, um, let's see, instead of a partial as an S-curve, as a cumulative. So uh, through each of these, uh, they're kind of different characteristics of customers um, and what appeals to them. If you overlay this on a policy uh, basis, you can kind of see uh, often the early programs, uh, information's being introduced and not a lot else. Sometimes voluntary guidelines and training programs. Uh, pilot programs are started before they're scaled up uh, in a larger way. Technical assistance, uh, there are a lot of complications to implementing uh, an effective and uh, sustainable landscape that's appealing to customers. Um, outreach to stakeholders, often financial incentives. Uh, the drought was, drought emergency was a major impetus for some of the financial incentives given for turf replacement in California. Um, some of these are adopted within uh, codes and ordinances. Uh, it's certainly true within California, um, and we certainly have an interesting regulatory uh, environment. And hopefully the idea is to improve everything as you uh, continue to go along. Um, there has sometimes been a distinction made between uh, market acceleration, um, which if limited to a program you're implementing in a few months or within a year, may not really end up in any permanent uh, change. Um, whereas market transformation uh, has uh, not just one kind of uh, or a limited number of collaborators, it's got a very diverse and broad number, and it induces a wide range of tactics reaching all cus consumers over time and uh, addresses different problems and constraints within the supply chain uh, and results in permanent market change in terms of what choices are available and what choices are being made. So uh, the punchline, and I... Uh, use some assistance from Lisa on this. Uh, market acceleration is the first step to market transformation, and the key thing there is not to stop. Um, there was an online uh, consumer landscape survey that went out to participants and non-participants where possible. Um, we got to do some geeky stuff with that, like figuring out a market segmentation analysis. Uh, if you were to put on the sorting hat, how would you sort your customers? Uh, who, based on the answering questions, uh, you know, can you identify those that are driven primarily by aesthetic reasons to begin with? Uh, who is mostly motivated by an environmental uh, sense of uh, mission? Those that are driven primarily by dollars, those are who want to save water as a means of saving dollars. Um, so key in this, in order to get traction influencing customers and engaging with them and taking your customer uh, engagement to the next level, 
you really need to figure out who your customers are because it won't be a single message that gets through to everyone. Let's see, uh, this is some early results of different uh, types of customers, uh, five specific buckets. We had uh, environmentalists who are the first movers, um, often no incentive is necessary. Uh, those who are cost sensitive, they're quick to move once an, uh, an incentive is offered. Uh, home improvers who are really, really fascinated by new technology and new innovation in the landscape uh, palette. Um, those who are very selective only adopt the technology once it's proven and easy. They want to make sure the neighbor's yard doesn't die before they try anything. And uh, Luddites who are just not interested in it. The Luddites were fine people, but they did have issues with change. So let me back up here. Um, assuming that everyone doesn't uh, and isn't interested in geeking out and doesn't have time to do that, there are often uh, much simpler ways to segment customers uh, on this basis uh, based on your available data. So uh, you don't actually have to do a cluster analysis in InSpace. Um, we also uh, needed to identify all the different motivations. So many of uh, the landscape transformation programs we we're looking at differed tremendously, even in areas where you would think they'd be the same. There was a regional incentive. The same incentive level was being offered, and yet the way the programs were implemented turned, it, turned out very differently depending on which retail water utility was in charge. Um, so we went through and made a, a laundry list. I think we started out with six and ended up with ten. Hopefully before the report comes out it will be something less than two dozen. Of all the different motivations for landscape uh, transformation programs, um, and this is often, this is kind of taking the water agency perspective, what drives them. Um, and you need to understand these motivations uh, so that you can properly design a landscape transformation program that will produce the results you want. Uh, the list of motivations include water supply issues, sufficiency and sustainability. So to uh, borrow a term from David Mitchell, we've often used outdoor landscaping as the hump on the camel, what we tap into when water becomes scarce. Uh, and that also means that if that's the case and you're not doing anything else in terms of drought resilience, you get a lot of dead plants very quickly. Um, the idea of sustainable landscapes is they can tolerate uh, a certain amount of drought. Water supply reliability, so uh, short-term drought management as opposed to long-term. Uh, this is uh, characterized what happened in the drought emergency. Um, water supply as a growth inducer, which depending on the service area can be a good or a bad thing. Um, the economic cost of water is a big driver. Uh, water quality, uh, urban slobber has been a big uh, issue in different communities that um, are near coastal areas or uh, threaten receiving bodies of water. Uh, regulatory mandates, energy use reduction, uh, climate change resilience, public perception, and customer benefits. So um, the idea of understanding these motivations is being able to pick out the different interventions that may need to be combined in a landscape transformation program. Um, and the idea of getting the right mix of these, and we had different participants who used different mixes of these, is to produce a desired set of benefits. So uh, we aspire to finalize this report in the near future. And uh, with that, I hit my 10-minute mark, I think. So I can leave time for Lisa to share her uh, insight. All right, thanks, Tom. I'm going to piggyback off of what Tom just shared with all of you guys to talk about how the agency I work for, the California Water Efficiency Partnership, has invested in research to really evaluate this marketing method called community-based social marketing um, with the objective of investigating is this a viable approach for shifting residential customer market preferences towards sustainable landscapes. 
That's a mouthful, so just bear with me as I explain this marketing process. So what I'm going to take you through is just a general discussion of what is community-based social marketing. Some of you may have never heard that term before, so I want to break it down for you so there's no confusion. Talk about how community-based social marketing is relevant to California's water conservation efforts. Um, what resources our agency is actually in invested in or are available to practitioners and then um, introduce some details that Krista will share from Long Beach about a collaborative research effort we're doing with Long Beach and a couple of other water agencies. So again, to eliminate any confusion, I thought I would begin with a brief discussion of what is community-based social marketing, breaking it down into a couple of its elements. Social marketing being um, a practice of creating positive social change by directly influencing individual behaviors. So collectively, individual behaviors can, tr can contribute to positive social change. And then where the community aspect comes in is um, uh, it, social marketing can be framed as community-based when it focuses on a group of individuals who share a common uh, connection. And that common connection can vary in size and geography. So that could include things like apartment complexes, uh, a neighborhood or a city residence, a utility service districts, a local watershed, or it can even be like a social or workplace network. And I also wanted to point out what community-based social marketing isn't. Uh, I like this quote here. It says, it rejects the assumption that increasing public knowledge about an issue will change individual behavior. And it also rejects that the logic um, that when individuals evaluate uh, a choice they might be able to make to save money, that's also not going to motivate them to take action. So community-based social marketing really harnesses the attributes of human sociability, and it, uh, it, it motivates behavior change beyond what financial incentives stimulate. Just wanted to drill, drill in that point. And uh, to, to make this note here that it's not a direct reference to social media outreach, although that can be incorporated into your marketing practices. So community-based social marketing is ultimately it seeks to identify and remove barriers to desire, desired behavior change uh, while simultaneously promoting associated benefits of that behavior. So behavior might be removing your turf, installing a sustainable landscape. And practitioners tend to follow this five-step approach that includes piloting specific CBSM tools prior to rolling out a broad-scale program. And in the context of sustainability, the effectiveness of a community-based social marketing campaign is often measured by comparing, comparing pre- and post-intervention metrics. So in the case of outdoor water efficiency and sustainable landscaping, you might want to look at monthly metered water consumption um, as a preferred metric for comparison. Um, the chart to my left here uh, shows you when the barriers, with a range of barriers and a range of benefits, what types of strategies the marketing approach offers to further entice people to take action. So. Um, Barriers are typically identified up front by surveying your target audience so as, again, to strategically choose uh, the best tools for mitigating barriers. And barriers might be structural, like lack of access to a resource needed to make the behavior change. It could be an economic barrier uh, where things are just cost prohibitive to take the action. And then benefits refer to a person's belief about the positive outcomes associated with the behavior. So this could be things like saving money, protecting the environment, or maybe even like receiving social recognition for taking the action. So when the barriers are high, we tend to want to incentivize people. Um, this is kind of common knowledge, right? Like that's why we see so many incentive and rebate programs with water utilities for turf replacement. That monetary incentive can really um, maybe help motivate people to take the next step. Um, contests are good at creating a sense of competitiveness among the, your target audience. Um, what else do we have? Commitments. You can solicit a public commitment to take a desired action. And research has shown that people are more likely to follow through if they publicly commit in person or written commitments. And then for lower barriers, we kind of look to things like social norming or social diffusion. 
So that basically rely, you rely on your peers to pressure and influence change. Uh, you want people to perceive the behavior as like everybody's doing it. You should jump on board. You should jump on. You should jump on the bandwagon as well. Moving on. Um, you know, why, how is community-based social marketing relevant to water conservation efforts? Specifically from the lens I'm sharing today, outdoor water use efficiency. Well, we can look to how the energy sector has utilized this type of marketing um, going as far back as 2008. Uh, the energy sector started to incorporate large-scale residential behavior programs to reduce energy use. Um, what they found was that uh, an untreated household, meaning in the studies that they performed, if they weren't uh, utilizing some of these uh, social norming messaging tactic tactics for those untreated households, um, they believed that their energy use was actually closer to the norm than it actually is. And then when you provided um, treatment, meaning when you messaged to these particular residents about, uh, you know, neighbors around you are being more efficient than you, they really started to grasp that uh, the true metric of their energy consumption. And we see that with water use. It's very similar. And so that because the energy market has been able to use this, this comparative method, like the social norming method of showing like you're actually not good at conserving resources as you think you are um, and have seen success from that, we feel like water can also apply the same method. Um, advances in technology can reduce decision making on the part of the consumer, but they do not eliminate the role of consumer behavior on usage. So as an example, when it comes to how consumers maintain their yard, um, we've observed really tremendous amounts of waste associated with irrigation management even after the installation of a smart controller. So again, drilling home that behavior, changing behavior is really where you're going to get the greatest margin of water savings. Um, we can rely on technology a little bit, but we've got to change how we interact with our landscapes and how we maintain them. Um, monetar monetary incentives and subsidies are exhaustible, meaning um, we really want the spillover effect to take precedent. We want people, we want to incentivize people up front and get a critical mass of people participating in landscape transformation work. And then we want people through social norming to observe those changes and then choose to do it on their own without being incentivized. And that's a way we can prevent exhausting these funds. Um, and then lastly, uh, voluntary drought measures were adopted by specific demographics. We, you know, there were some folks that were really willing to get on board and participate in um, a lot of the rebate and incentive programs, but then there was also this group that were really hard to motivate to get on board with landscape conversions, and that we want to drill down into the behavior of why, what it, how do they think, what are their attitudes, beliefs, what are the barriers that they possess, really trying to understand that community, that demographic, and try to get them on board. So again, looking more at behavior and state of mind of people. Um, I'm going to kind of breeze through this. Uh, it's a brief history of a stakeholder-driven effort that explains why CalWEP took interest in CBSM. So we started by collecting about 350 stakeholders across the state saying, what is, what do, let's define this, this landscape transition. What does it look like? We, we said it's a watershed approach. It's not only going to conserve water, but we want to integrate elements into the landscape that build healthy soil, that reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions, that reduce green waste coming off the landscapes. So then we said, okay, how can we transform the market to get people on board with adopting this new norm watershed approach? We produced a framework, which Tom mentioned. We outlined barriers and interventions to getting on board with that market transformation. One of the barriers that stands out that's relevant to this talk is that there's um, turf is sort of the status quo. Um, it's reinforced by turf dominant landscapes and a false belief that sustainable landscapes are more costly to purchase and install. So then we said, okay, what are some interventions to overcoming that barrier? We need to redefine end user values and do come up with uh, effective marketing and outreach. Great, so now let's write a plan. And in the plan we said, here are some strategies we can follow to really try to shift the market, get people on board, overcome these barriers. 
we want we need an integrated messaging and branding campaign and we need to hire a, a, a firm capable of executing community-based social marketing so now we're here this is this is the history of, of our agency's involvement with this marketing strategy and we're ready to implement some CBSM approaches so right I wanted to share with you some resources that are available that Cowup has developed that um, will introduce you to this concept of community-based social marketing we have a really detailed literature review and case study report that will be published in the very near future um, we have a community-based pilot framework uh, that focuses on turf replacement it's an outline of how as a agency if you want to um, use this marketing approach uh, it's California framed and it's 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 not um, parsed out to really a lot of specifics but it just tells you how you might be able to approach this from a, a piloting perspective and then um, Chris is going to get into this a bit more but we did uh, we hired a social and behavioral science team of experts and they developed this lovely landscape and outdoor water survey for us which can be administered either in person or online through a platform like SurveyMonkey. I, that's available now. I could email it to you if, if you'd like to get a copy of that. So the case study review, I'm going to breeze through this. Uh, it was a comprehensive literature review. We looked at yielded 62 case studies, and we pared that down to six that we, that we thought were um, successful models of how CBSM was used in the world of outdoor water use efficiency. And then we summarized those case studies for you in a nice report. Uh, let's see. I wanted to briefly talk about some of the key findings from that case study review. So we saw that water, when CBSM was applied, it actually did drive water savings. The, the range kind of varied. We saw 9 to 20%, a range of 9 to 20% savings in water. Uh, for longer-term conservation, it's best to focus on specific behaviors that use a large amount of water and to target changes that will have a lasting change. We want to focus on dur durability of change, meaning um, there was a tendency in some of the case studies we saw to focus on immediate water savings rather than long-term. And a long-term focus means priorita prioritizing one-time actions, such as replacing water-intensive landscapes with climate appropriate landscapes or maybe even installing rain barrels. Um, this is contrasted with case studies that focus on things like just skip a week of landscape watering. These types of behavior changes uh, require continual reinforcement and they're sometimes viewed as like sacri they're a sacrifice that the consumer is taking and so they kind of fall off over time. People tend to not uh, maintain that behavior. So. There's that, and evaluation is critical. We want to just be able to evaluate how effective this marketing is by measuring metrics after we launch the marketing campaign is really what this is drilling down to. Um, effective strategies range from highly personalized to mass media, so it's good to use an umbrella strategy that includes a branded set of communication and then follow up with like targeted personal communication to the community you're trying to target. And cost is not the only barrier. Again, I mentioned sometimes it's um, status or social norm pressures that prevent people from getting on board. I'm going to skip over this framework and talk about the residential survey and just touch on some of the results that we've seen. So uh, again, we did the case study, the framework, and then we said, great, now let's put together this survey that can be implemented, um, that water agencies can, uh, you know, if there's a, we, we recruited Long Beach and East Bay Mud and Rancho Water, California Water down in Temecula, and we said, let's target high water users. Um, we've got this great survey that was uh, developed by social and behavioral science experts. We're going administ to administer it online through a SurveyMonkey platform. We're going to get all this great data, and then we're going to hand that data back over to Action Research to analyze and create profiles for why these high water users who historically have not gotten on board with landscape transformation, what is it about them that is preventing them from taking that next step? So we're in the midst of that work right now. Um, those results will probably be published sometime this summer. Uh, this is what the survey tried to drill down into, how residents perceive and value turf, identify barriers, benefits, knowledge gaps. 
and then to quickly share with you just some high-level findings. Um, you know, the, the results of this survey ultimately are going to inform improved messaging for targeted groups, and it's going to uh, ho hopefully inform modifications to existing conservation programs around sustainable landscaping. So of the three agencies that participated, we saw the same response for the highest ranked barriers. So here they are. They value saving, saving water, saving money on their water bill, and helping the environment. They didn't really seem to care so much about what their neighbors thought about their yards. That was a low benefit. And then when it came to barriers, um, you know, cost again, there's other home improvement projects that are more important, the time commitment to making the landscape change, and then the lowest ranked barriers, um, which I thought were really interesting. I need a place for my kids and pets to play wasn't really highly valued by this demographic. Um, Again, this is pretty uniform results for all three regions of the state that launched the survey, so it's pretty fascinating to see that these things kind of fell to the top or bottom uniformly, no matter um, who, which customer base was responding. And I thought this was really fascinating, too. It just demonstrates that this high water using demographic that we targeted for this survey, they still think that the majority of water use um, is attributed to their indoor consumption. So um, in the case of Long Beach and East Bay Mud, we saw you know, upwards of 70% of people still thinking that outdoor water use was minimal compared to the indoor environment. So highlights an, an educational opportunity there for those customers. And then lastly, uh, this is my last slide, I just wanted to share with you some resources that are available on the topic. Um, the CUWCC, which is a former name of our organization, produced this best management practice guidebook on customer water use messaging. It talks about the CBSM method. That's available online. Um, I left this book downstairs, but this is a great book talking about sort of the basics of community-based social marketing and how to apply it to resource conservation work. And then lastly, Water Smart Software has a nice, quick, succinct summary of community-based social marketing, which is another great introduction to the topic. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Krista. She's going to talk a bit more about the survey uh, administration and results that we've seen. Thanks, Lisa. You had to throw in the one about the uh, indoor versus outdoor. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not doing my job well enough. Uh, <coughs> So good afternoon. I'm I'm sort of the the small scale. You know, we we went from large to small. Tom talked very high picture, big picture, and then Lisa is helping us get even smaller. And, and so I'm going to talk now about what it's like on a water agency perspective. Um, before I start, just a little bit of information. Oops, on the Long Beach Water Department. Uh, for those of you less familiar, maybe you've spent your entire life in Northern California, where the the other city with an aquarium. <laughs> Okay, the southern one, <laughs> um, but there's so much more to us than that. Um, so we were founded in 1911. We are one of the founding member agencies of the Metropolitan Water District, which is the large-scale wholesaler that most people have heard of. Um, we are the seventh largest city in California. We were once the fifth, but since we can't get any bigger and everybody else can, <laughs> um, we, are, we are very stuck. And so Fresno and all those cities that can still go out get, are, are passing us by. Um, our population is approximately 500,000 people, which is a lot of people if you look at the uh, square footage of Long Beach itself. Um, we are proud conservers in Long Beach. Uh, we surpassed our state mandate for conservation during the last drought um, without fail every single time. And we are one of the few agencies to have seen minimal to no bounce back from the drought. Um, there's been serious concerns for Metropolitan as a whole of people actually using more water than they did in 2013. We are one of the few member agencies who can say we've seen nothing like that. We're well below. And currently, our GPCD, residential, is hovering at around 63. That's indoor and outdoor combined GPCD. Thank you. <laughs> so we work hard. <laughs> And one of our flagship programs, the, the program that we're most known for, is our Lawn to Garden tra Landscape Transformation Program. This program began in 2010. At, by today, nearly 4,000 participants have removed over 3.5 million square feet of turf in Long Beach. Um, 
we have a Londa Garden tour and festival that we put on every year where we highlight some of the best homes from the past year. And we have over 2,500 people who register and attend that tour. Um, and for a small city tour, that's, that's a big number. You know, we competing against things like Theodore Payne and some of the bigger ones. Um, that's a good number for our little tour. Our program has been duplicated all over the country. We're very proud of that. My favorite is actually um, the city of New Orleans took our program and, and created what they're calling the Front Yard Initiative. And they uh, used pretty much our exact program to encourage people to remove concrete and put in gardens to help with flooding. So if you ever see in New Orleans, it's a really great program. We are in the process of adding new programs to Lawn Garden. There's uh, lots of different ideas that we've been floating around. A new parkway program, a direct install program for disadvantaged communities, um, a thirsty lawn program where we're going to be targeting some of those people who really will never change over their lawn. We're going to start working with them a little bit more closely. Uh, but the idea behind working with Cowup really came from this idea that while Londa Garden is great and it's worked really well for us, we needed to start digging in. As Tom was saying before, the environmentalists went first. We got our early adopters. By this point in our program, we've hit a lot of the late adopters. And uh, now we need to get to the Luddites. So that's what we're doing. So when Cowup first approached us, approached us to partner in the agencies to pilot the toolbox, um, we were very, very excited. I had already anecdotally been looking at maps and thinking, why am I not getting that neighborhood? How come nobody over here is doing our program? What are we doing wrong? And I couldn't figure out a good way to, f to find the answer. I mean, everyone's done a survey, and, and you can ask and try to change your marketing. You change your incentive amount. You start doing knocking on people's doors if you feel like that will work. But I knew there had to be a better way to get some good information. So we were really excited and interested in understanding why we were getting that low participation in certain areas of Long Beach. And, and most specifically, why is traditional marketing not working in certain neighborhoods? You know, we were doing the same kind of marketing that pretty much all water agencies are doing in terms of our program. Um, if you look at everyone's brochures, they all kind of look the same. <laughs> we're giving the same benefits. We're explaining why you want to do it. We're telling you how beautiful it can be and how much water and money you're going to save and energy as well. But there's just obviously something that we were missing, and we wanted to know what that was. So we decided on a sample of about 8,000 community members who live in single-family residences. Um, this is our very nice hand-drawn map <laughs> that we were using to work off of. Uh, we started with, because the, the, the group as a whole wanted to do it this way, high water users in our target zip codes. You know, so uh, in conjunction with East Bay Mud and Rancho California, we determined what a high water user was and decided those are the people we're going to target. As I said before, there were neighborhoods that I had been staring at on a map for years, and I wanted to know what was happening there. So I also added in another 4,000 people that were just considered average water users in those target neighborhoods because I was determined, <laughs> I am still determined to get into some of these neighborhoods. <laughs> um, so we received about 1,045 responses, and 687 of those were considered to currently have lawns. That's the way they answered the question. And so they're part of our analysis. We only needed 400 responses to do our analysis, and we were very excited to get such a good response rate with very minimal effort on our part. So these are some of the initial results. Uh, all of our data right now has been sent to Action Research for analysis, uh, but we don't have that analysis back yet, so we've been doing some in-house brief overview of the data. <laughs> and I know Lisa has, has sort of told you what the group is seeing, but I'll show you also what Long Beach saw specifically. So for the benefits associated with replacing grass lawns, uh, we've seen things. Uh, the top two were saving money on your water bill, and then on the second one, which was saving water. So we were actually very surprised, because if they were really interested in saving water and saving money, that's not what we've been telling them <laughs> for the last eight years. <laughs> um, so actually, that was, a, that was a big shock for us. We really thought we were going to see something differently um, that maybe we were just weren't addressing in our research, which tells us that there is another benefit or another barrier that we're missing. Because if we're already marketing to their top benefits, clearly there's, there's a step that we're losing. 
And we also asked, what are your agreement with these opinions about water-wise landscapes? And our top answers were, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm satisfied with my landscape the way it is. <laughs> Leave me alone, is what I call it. <laughs> And the other one uh, being that you are actually interested in water-wise landscapes. Again, surprising. Well, the leave me alone was not surprising. <laughs> but the one that said that they were actually interested in water-wise landscapes was surprising because we've been talking about it for eight years. And if you were interested in it, you should have done it by now. Um, and again, these are all new data, new results that are saying, okay, either we're marketing the wrong way, you're just not getting the information, or we're still not addressing some other issue that you're not really telling us about. And what I actually really like about this one is that at least they understand that their yard is not already water-wise <laughs> with turf. Um, so even if they think that 70% of their water is used indoors, they understand that grass doesn't <laughs> use water well. So I'm gonna take that as a positive. <laughs> <laughs> that part of our education program is working, and I'm going to go with that. Um, so as Lisa was saying before, we're still in the analysis phase of this. We're going to get more information from Action Research on the real barriers, the benefits, and those behaviors that we're just not hitting with our traditional marketing. We're very excited for that. Um, of the three agencies that are going to be that did the survey, uh, Long Beach is actually the only one that has signed on to do the marketing phase of the program. So we're the pilot for actually implementing a CBSM marketing plan. And we're very excited for that. We're going to, Action Research is going to identify our barriers, our benefits, our motivators for participation. They're going to tell us how our residents receive their information and where our knowledge gaps are, although clearly one of them is where their water goes. <laughs> um, and we're going to use these results to get our CBSM marketing plan that's going to be tailored for Long Beach. And for me, what I'm looking for is, all right, in 90807, one of our high water use areas, one of our uh, more expensive areas of Long Beach, I'm going to find something for just that one street that's really driving me crazy. <laughs> and I'm going to market to that street if it kills me. Uh, so that's what I'm hoping to get out of Action Research. <laughs> Um, the program they're going to be giving for us will be based on a primary strategy. So what is the one main barrier that we're going to try to overcome? If it's commitment, if it's a social norm, if it's a behavior change, all the marketing approach is going to be based around that one issue. So we'll be able to address it in that area. And of course, we get to collaborate and decide on that together. They're going to provide our program design and determine our communication channels. For example, uh, you can use uh, influencers to speak to a social norm. Um, what I really love about CBSM is you spend your entire life telling your children not to give in to peer pressure, and that's exactly what CBSM is. <laughs> okay. All we're doing is flipping it and saying, I, I mean, it's entirely a marketing strategy that says, well, everyone else is doing it, so you should do it too. <laughs> um, so instead of telling people not to do that, we're flipping it and saying, Let's go ahead and use peer pressure <laughs> since it seems to work so well on teenagers. Um, and <laughs> honestly, <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um, but we're very excited for that. And, and I think the thing that's important for us uh, on a city level and a water agency level is um, while we're looking for CBSM to hit those target neighborhoods and to really help us in our high water use areas and our high income areas, it's not the only strategy we're applying or that we're, we're going to be using. Um, so I would encourage other water agencies um, to really understand that every community needs a different approach. This is our high water use approach. This is our high income approach. Um, we're taking a very different tactic with our vulnerable communities in Long Beach. Uh, that is more resource-based and one-on-one um, -on -one commitment based of, of actually getting into the community and working with them and giving them things that they need resources up front instead of trying to motivate them, we're actually going to be providing them with things. Um, and so for other water agencies that are interested in doing something like this, it's very important that I think the first step to identify the communities that you're trying to reach because every strategy is going to change based on who you're trying to get. I talked fast so there'd be time for questions. Um, here's my information if you'd like to talk to me anymore. Otherwise, I think we're ready for the panel.
No questions? Hi, I'm Cora Kammeyer with the Pacific Institute. And a question I had was all this is focused on residential properties, and I'm wondering if you guys are doing anything around commercial, industrial, institutional landscapes. Can you hear me? Okay, that's working. Okay, it's working now. Uh, I can't see you, but I can still <laughs> answer the question. Um, so again, I think that actually harkens back to what I said last, which is that every community or every everybody you're trying to reach takes a different approach. Um, so we do market to CII. We have a CII a com component to our Lana Garden program, but that is, we believe, less able to be regulated by CBSM. That uh, that takes right. another approach. We're taking a, um, a concierge approach to that, uh, making them feel special and coming out and doing a lot of the work for them to, to make things easy for them and also um, provide them with financial incentives. Actually, finances work really well for CII if they're done correctly. Uh, so we are marketing, but not through CBSM. And I just wanted to mention, too, with the case study I described, how we, we looked at, like, 62 case studies that uh, employed CBSM to try to influence water efficiency. Um, the majority of them were all residential-based, and we wanted to learn from those past uh, research efforts and try to integrate that into what we're, we want to do in California. And so that's not to exclude um, larger, like, institutional-sized uh, parcels that that are also good candidates for for landscape transformation. It's just this is the this is the begin the starting point for us, and so we want to see what what evolves from this. And and with the effort that Long Beach is initiating by developing a, a full blown CBSM marketing campaign, um, learning from that and then seeing if that can apply to other sectors of the market. Do you know of any CBSM programs that are used in the commercial sector in landscaping or other behavior change? Um, so the CI sector tends to be fundamentally different um, and not driven by social media. Now, the, there are companies that employ social media and take advantage of uh, the aesthetic they create, but it's it's from the water agency perspective, um, it takes a very different thing, um, and certainly in uh, parts of the country that had uh, turf removal incentives, uh, they often were did have very large uptake by the CI sector. Um, they tend to be very driven by economics. Um, the exceptions of that tend to be the uh, HOA, some of the uh, residences that have uh, this disjuncture between who has their hand on the controller and uh, the accountant who pays the bills and the board that approves, and there's this huge disconnect there. So uh, there have been some very innovative programs on that that do uh, training that also link real-time reporting of water consumption, uh, to the boards that are authorizing the accountant to pay the bill. So there's some interesting and different innovations that have happened there. Um, but that uh, the landscape transformation study I was working on explicitly had a residential focus from the get-go. Um, one of the things that struck me on one of the slides was the, the response that was quite high in the one of the barriers, which was that I have competing household projects. And um, that's something that, you know, you might not be able to change no matter how much money you throw to CBSM study uh, when the economy um, and people's income is reduced in terms of cost of living. You know, you, the landscape is often uh, a sideshow to the structural repairs that need to go on in a home. So it just made me think about, in your study, how do you exclude people that are renters 
for instance, in those neighborhoods that don't have the agency to mm -hmm. do these improvements. They don't have, they're not empowered by the homeowner and it's not their property. And there's so much, there's in some communities, it's like 60, 70% renting. Okay. So we actually do have a very large uh, rental community in Long Beach. Um, and, and our program is, <coughs> excuse me, is unique in that we do actually allow renters to do our landscape transformation program. Um, as long as the homeowner says it's okay. <laughs> uh, but we, we try not to actually exclude renters. We, we want them to understand that just because they don't own the home doesn't mean they can't take ownership of the projects in and around the home. Um, and that's a twofold problem. One, obviously, you want to engage the renters, but then also making the homeowners feel comfortable with that and being okay with that. And, and what we found um, is that by lending our name to it and saying, you know, the water department is helping and we're going to provide you the resources, we're going to provide you the incentives, we're going to tell you how to do it so that it's done effectively and done well. Um, you can feel safe when your renter go, goes ahead and puts in a drought tolerant garden because we're going to, we're maintaining that quality and we're, we're telling you that the quality will be good because we're, we're requiring it to be. Um, and we did not in the survey want to exclude renters necessarily because we do have a large rental population in Long Beach and, and that information is important as well for us to capture. I guess I would add to that is that we also, our programs are eligible for, uh, EB MUD's long conversion program is also eligible for renters and we're trying to kind of front load more resources on easy long conversions and also kind of keeping the quality up, like the planting requirements. So that's one way we're trying to approach it and just make it easier to do. Hi, this question is for Krista. I was wondering whether, I if you've seen in any of your analysis and findings so far, if the disconnect has been more with the messaging or with the methods to get um, word out and um, if it's the latter, if you're thinking about new and different ways to try to reach that particular zip code that um, haven't worked before. So that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think that the way we've been looking at it and the, the way the data is sort of lending itself is that um, our methods are okay for the most part, but the message is wrong which is why we're very encouraged about doing the CBSM study and, and changing that message. Um, despite the 70-30 the indoor-outdoor issue, um, it does seem that most of our results are showing that people did know about the program and they're aware of the incentive and they're aware of our push for that um, in Long Beach, but we are not speaking to whatever will encourage them to do it. And so we really are looking to change that message using CBSM. Um, so I'm curious because people said they didn't care what their neighbors would say, but what the CBSM whole approach is saying, no, you really do care, <laughs> right? So uh, just tell, talk to me about that. Okay, so that's uh, so so that's interesting because that's one thing that CBSM says, um, and so one of the ideas is a social norm. However, it's not the only one, and I think Lisa could probably speak to that better than I could. Um, they, that's sort of the easy one to explain. So everyone, when we're talking about CBSM, we always say, well, it's like a social norm change and you're changing that. But there's other ones. There's commitment. There's um, barriers to construction. There's lots of different um, barriers that we can address. And so that's what we're waiting to get from action research is maybe social norm, you know, based on our data and them saying they don't care what their neighbors think, social norms is not our barrier. We have a different one that we'll be using instead. I don't want to add to that at all. I just, <laughs> I'm just trying to think, do I have anything <laughs> additional to add to that comment? Um, no, I think, I think you succinctly answered that question. I'll, I'll pile on there. Uh, it's often the case that you get customers, and the human brain is an amazing thing. It works on many different levels. So uh, at the, the frontal cortex may be saying in the surveys, uh, yeah, I want to save water and save money, and that pretty much covers it. Um, but they're often much deeper values involved. And especially with uh, a front yard, it's really a subset of your image to the world. 
Um, so uh, the term landscape uh, was traced as far back, of course, the landscape painters um, in Holland, and the term landscape was which part of Holland you were from. And they could tell from a picture which area it was, and therefore what your character was. So your area of origin was your identity. So just as we have kind of a landscape framing here, uh, it turns into a portrait of who you are. So it's, it's an amazing thing. I, I just wanted to mention, too, that with the action research analysis, they're going to do a more detailed segmentation analysis. So our first... Cri filter criteria for the survey was high water users that historically have been non-receptive to these programs. And then um, we have a lot of, I think there were 34 questions total on the survey. There were, there was a lot. And so, you know, we would probably parse out that group and filter those responses, look, you know, screen them for how they responded in other ways. Action Research is going to create profiles for how people responded um, based on those filters, and that segmentation analysis is going to be really interesting. So for that particular group, yeah, social norming may not be the best approach. Um, so. Hi, I'm Kevin with the City of Palo Alto. Just to add to that, we had OPower, the behavior-based program you were mentioning, and also WaterSmart. So most people, you ask them in the program, they say it won't work, but that's when you see in the studies behavior-based programs work. Because a survey with self-selection, you're not going to say, I did this from peer pressure from my neighbor, or that I was ranked 100 out of 100. So again, I think that's when you look at these programs, it's doing that scientific study and actually doing the treatment group and seeing, giving those tailored responses based on participation. And I just wanted to add, from these locations, did any of these people have behavior-based programs like WaterSmart, and was that a factor in the survey? So we actually do have WaterSmart. Um, we did these as two separate uh, adventures, and, and while there's probably overlap from our high water users, it wasn't specifically like we were going to exclude or include anybody who was already getting our water smart information. Um, we wanted we wanted pure data, so we just wanted to to give them a different perspective with the survey. Um, we've seen improvements with water smart, however, since it's a paper and an email based, you know, checkup happy face, sad face, whatever you want to call it. Um, I don't think that's something we can market off of. And I wanted CBSM to us was a way to really get into the muts and bolts of marketing a specific program as opposed to uh, WaterSmart, where we do include on those, those letters that we send out on a regular basis, hey, Wanda Garden is still over here, and you know we've given you a lot of money if you want to come do it. Um, clearly, that's one of our original... Uh, marketing that wasn't working, that we wanted to try something else. Um, I worked on one of the big uh, uh, control treatment uh, anal impact analyses um, at the original pilot at East Bay Mud, and uh, there were some very interesting results there um, about how uh, receiving information from WaterSmart had this collateral effect on increasing uptake of other conservation programs. So customers who were used to receiving that information and started pondering, well, how could I change that? Um, they were, I think, five or six times more likely to participate in other programs, roughly speaking. So uh, it's not that they're unrelated, and I think we're only starting to scrape the surface of how you can best leverage this stuff, which is why I'm very um, excited at the higher level of granularity that uh, Lisa and her program are able to dig into. She cuts that off just to test you. <laughs> uh, so water conservation and like water rights and water allocation, do you foresee any conflicts uh, like moving forward uh, like especially like areas in Humboldt where they have a lot of a lot of old mills where they had a lot of allocating like they allocated that water and if they don't use it they lose it. Uh, do you see any like I don't know, basically do you foresee any conflicts in the future about like water rights or something that we can change in water policy? 
So the, the questions on the relationship between water rate rights and conservation. Right, that, that's how I'm understanding the question. Um, I can't speak to that as a whole. I can say that in Long Beach, you know, we have a guaranteed water right. Uh, we're in an adjudicated basin, so our groundwater is a guaranteed right. Um, our allocation for metropolitan is also a set number. So we're not concerned that just because we're using a lot less water than we have been five, ten years ago, um, that we're somehow going to lose that water. It'll still be there for us. Um, but if either of you have perspectives outside of that. You're all over this. There's a huge disconnect there. So Western water law was set up to keep people from killing each other. I was here first. <laughs> um, and the use it or lose it is a huge disincentive towards figuring out how to change your practices to use water more efficiently. No mystery. Well, I'm, the question is um, that I'm looking for a confirmation of my understanding. And um, if I understand correctly, community-based social marketing is not social media marketing, no, it's not. but it is a new approach to marketing. And what's different about it is that it involves social scientists and research and comprehensive piloting before you make your major investment in your campaign. I think you just summarized it perfectly. <laughs> but I just wanted to mention too that it might not be the most cost effective approach for all demographics, but it seemed worthwhile with high water users because there was such a large margin to conserve water. It was worthwhile to really get down to this type of granular, granular level of analysis um, to, to develop a really tailored marketing uh, program um, and that involves not just messaging too but also uh, reevaluating how conservation programs can maybe be redesigned to attract uh, people you know make them more attractive for folks to get on board so well, again not always the most cost effective option but but the most effective because the w because traditional marketing has been proven time and time again like by PG&E, actually, all that money that it, traditional marketing applied to trying to change behavior, what we've learned is that it doesn't work. Like just <laughs> making a message, you know, without the social science um, research. So I, I think social science research can help focus that and make it more effective. I will say that mass media campaigns in water um, have a demonstrable effect. So, but it is a short-term effect, and it's a very different uh, nut they're trying to crack about uh, increasing uptake, uh, putting in sustainable landscaping that can survive a drought. Thank you for that clarification. Hi, there's prizes downstairs if you want to go to the raffle. Yay! Yeah. Double prizes.